Good morning, church. Welcome this morning to Binghamton First Church of the Nazarene. Excited about what God is doing in these days in spite of all of the circumstances that seem to be surrounding us. I have a few announcements this morning that we're going to go over, and, uh, and then we're going to pray together. I want to thank you and those who were able to be a part of the blood drive during this past week. Um, including this last week, as a church and as a community, we've given almost 100 pints of blood in four drives. That is very, very good. Um, the next drive is already scheduled. If you weren't able to give this time and you want to give next time, uh, you can go to the Red Cross Blood whatever um, website, and you can register for our next one, which is on November the 19th. November the 19th from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Now that's different. It's going to be in the afternoon so that those who work can try to schedule to give after work. Um, we'll try to switch the times each time so that it's convenient for those who are working as well. Um, we have some exciting news about our app. Some of you may have already noticed this, but on our phone app now you can access music uh, from the week or weeks before as we begin to load them in. Um, that'll include just the audio on those. And then uh, if you go to the media button, you can see a spot there for worship music. And you click on that and it'll have a drop down menu for you. Uh, and we're also expanding some of the other things on the app. If you go into the media under sermons, uh, we'll have some special music there like Nicole's song from last week. You can access there as well. This Saturday is our 50-plus luncheon at uh, Smoky Legend up in Glen Aubrey, and that is at 12.30. 12.30, if you'd like to join them. Well, we're going to be, say, 12.30, so if you're there at 12.30, you won't be late. And uh, lastly, if you would like to give to the Freedom Sunday offering, you can still do that this week and in the future if you so does uh, designate your giving. We're grateful for what God is doing through the Church of the Nazarene around the world. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're excited to be in your house, to be uh, with, connected with our friends online, and we're also excited because we are here to worship you. So we ask now that you would allow us to sense your presence, to understand the significance of these moments together. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way.
As we prepare to pray together, one of the things that is constantly on our minds in these days are, are we going to get a call saying we were somewhere where someone was positive? <laughs> and it's very frustrating. And for many of us, um, like myself, there are very few places that I need to go, and, and most of them are like the grocery store or something, and it doesn't seem that big a deal. I wear my mask and so forth. But when you go somewhere to eat or something like that and they give you a call, hey, this is contact tracing, not only does it disrupt your life, but it disrupts many of the things that you have your hands on. During these days, things might seem to be changing that we do not have control over. But we need to remember that our circumstances do not define who we are in God's eyes. And they do not keep us from making the appointments that he has set for us. His plan and purpose for us is that we share our faith whenever we have the opportunity or wherever. Whether that's in the home in our community or wherever we are. Our responses to these uncertainties sometimes reveal what we believe is true about the God we serve. As we pray this morning, help, ask that God will help us to allow him to be God day by day. Let's pray. Father, in all that changes around us, you never change. You are the same from one day to the next. Throughout every generation, you are God. And you are God alone. We have gathered in your name. And we have worshipped 
sensing your presence. And yet in the quietness of some moments of each day, there are thoughts that distract us from who you are and your purpose for us. Would you allow us, Father, to be reminded of your word in these days, to be reminded of the promise and our true purpose and rely on you? Will you allow us to recognize circumstances don't define, but your purpose does? You have called us to something that is eternal. May we have the opportunity to see day by day your hand at work. Father, we want to thank you for the events of this past week, for those that have had surgery successfully and are beginning to recover. We want to thank you for the ability for uh, our local body of believers to host the blood drive. And we ask, Father, that you would allow those, um, that blood that was um, donated to reach out with life. And that those who are touched by that would have the opportunity to hear the hope of the gospel as well. We ask, Father, that you would prepare the hearts of each of us in these days to recognize opportunities to share who you are in our lives. Sometimes, help us to share without words. We ask, Father, that as we enter into uh, the days that are ahead, that we would be able to do so with an understanding, with a hope, and with a motivation that comes from the love that you have shared to us. An unconditional love that you are asking us to extend to others. Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, would you motivate and prepare us for what's next? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you once again for your giving in these days and your enabling the Church of the Nazarene through its Missions International to reach around the world. Freedom Sunday is the opportunity for us to remember. And I don't want us to forget very soon that there are those that are living in situations that we would cringe. That there are those that need hope. Jesus came to set them free. And whether it's through our giving or through our prayers, I trust that you will remember those who are part of the human trafficking trade. Not just those that are victims, because they're all victims. Whether they think they're in charge or not, they are a victim and need Christ's saving love and hope. Well, at this time, I'm going to ask that you stand with us as we read from God's Word. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me 
what he will make known to you. This is the gospel of our Lord.
this morning in the sanctuary. I apologize for not having a uh, projector. This is one of those moments when technology seems to put us at a disadvantage because um, we're able to show everything on the live stream this morning, but here in the sanctuary, um, nada. So it must be a God thing. So I'm going to ask that you pull your Bibles out and that you turn to the second chapter of Acts. Uh, Maybe you'll want to open your Bible app if you don't have your Bible with you this morning. Power to live. Power to live. That's why we have um, started this series to discover God's plan for power to live. How did the disciples and apostles, this group of 120, how did they find themselves in the right place at the right time to experience the coming of the Holy Spirit? Well, as we've discovered in the last two weeks, the first thing that they did was they answered the question, what time is it for themselves? They answered the question, what time is it? They had asked Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, you don't need to worry about God's timing. Instead, you need to be prepared. You need to be in the right place so that when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power to be my witnesses. The second thing that we learn was that they need to answer the question, what is truth? And last week we answered that question, what is truth? The problem is, for each of us, that truth is what we're already living by. It's what we choose to build our life on. It's how we make decisions. It's why we make decisions. You see... When we ask the question, what is truth? The way that the disciples and the apostles did in that 40 days and then 10 days leading up until the day of Pentecost. They asked the question, what is truth for themselves? And they decided God's purpose, God's plan, and God's timing. All in the example of Jesus Christ lived out was going to be their foundation. You see, they asked the question, what time is it? And Jesus said, it's time to surrender to God's plan and purpose and timing. They asked the question, what is truth? And answered it with all that we find in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. His life, ministry, death or passion, his resurrection, and his ascension and sending of the Holy Spirit. You see, when you get right down to it, when you ask these two questions, what time is it and what is truth, they lead to this word surrender. Um, One of the things that I think of when I think of the word surrender is the fact that we as Nazarenes, as one of our basic understandings of the Christian life, hold to this concept that you can live a holy life. Holiness. And when we say that word, it's a church word, right? Holiness. So let's get a picture for a moment of what holiness really is. When Tammy and I got married, uh, wedding was beautiful, we got to the reception, and there was a lot of food, and there was a cake there. And in front of that cake was plates and all that stuff, but there was this one special utensil. It was what we were going to serve our wedding cake with. It was, you know, that spatula knife thingy. (laughs) It was, for that moment, for Tammy and I, holy. It was set apart for one purpose, and one purpose only, to serve that cake to everyone. It was not something ethereal. It was just set apart. 
On our first anniversary, we tried to cut that frozen cake that tastes like chalk. We used the, you know, holy instrument. When, if I remember correctly, on our son's first birthday, we got out the holy utensil. And you might laugh and think that's sacrilegious, but it's that simple. You see, holiness is when I surrender to be used only for God's purposes. It's that simple. Holiness. When I allow him to call the shots, when his plan, purpose, and timing allow me to know and love and serve. It's holiness. The disciples had put themselves in the position to be ready for something that only God could do in God's timing. And in chapter 2 of Acts, this is what happened. When we ask these questions and answer them for ourselves, and whether you've choose, chosen to answer them out loud or not, you've answered them. Because the life you currently live is based on what time you believe it is and what you believe is true. The disciples had chosen, and they had aligned themselves, put themselves right in the position so that they were ready for what was next. Power to live. And we're going to ask the question this morning, who is listening? Who is listening? Again, it's not a question that just jumps right off the page when we read Acts. But it is revealed by what takes place on Pentecost morning. You see, the first people that were listening were the apostles and disciples, that one group of 120. They listened to what Jesus said about what time it is and what is truth. They listened and they put themselves right where they were going to, right where they needed to be in order for what was next. You remember the passage, the key verse is, but you will receive power, Acts 1.8, but you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses here, there, and all around the world. In light of that, the apostles and the disciples were listening. But that's not where it stops. Let's look at, this, let's look at the passage. If we were watching the slides, we would be skipping down to Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. We're going to read that together. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They were all together in one place. So let's think about that for a minute. What day was it? It was the day of Pentecost. Now, you and I, if you grow up in the church, you're looking back, the day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came, but that's not exactly true. You see, on that morning, the day of Pentecost had already happened 1,500 times. The day of Pentecost was the day where they celebrated one of the three main feasts of the Jewish year. It was a celebration of harvest, and during the intertestamental period, or the 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and when the New Testament was written, in those 400 years as well, it was also known as the day, 50 days after Passover, Pentecost, when Moses came down the mountain with the law. Pentecost was always observed on the first day of the week because it represented something new was happening. New law, and in this case, new power because the Holy Spirit was coming. But let's not mistake the fact that we think the day of Pentecost is just about the Holy Spirit coming. It's the day on which God chose in his timing to reveal the power of the Holy Spirit to the disciples and apostles who put themselves right in a position to receive the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. They were together 
unified. And this, remember, reminds us that they were being obedient. Jesus said, but stay in the city until what I am going to send comes, until the Comforter comes, until power from the Holy Spirit comes. Now, the day of Pentecost, if you look back at the giving of the law, there were two signs that were given. There was a sound. If you remember the story when the law was given, God spoke from the cloud and the people said, oh no, this will never do. Moses, you go up and talk to him. We don't want to hear that again. And Moses went up the mountain. But all during this time, there was the sign of thunder and lightning and fire and smoke on the mountaintop. On the day of Pentecost, there was a sound and there was a sight. They were together in one place on the day that God had already appointed, but they were there because they put themselves in a position to receive and to access the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 and verse 2. Verse 2 reads this way. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were were sitting suddenly sounds like the a song or something suddenly when you and i think about suddenly it's a surprise typically right we weren't expecting it at that moment but it happens it's sudden i don't know why luke chooses to use this word but he wants us to recognize they were being obedient They were in one place, they were together, and as we learn in this verse, they were sitting, maybe praying, or getting ready to go to the temple to worship. Whatever they were doing, it was exactly what God had asked them to do while they were waiting. While they were waiting. They were patient, but they were not idle. They were patient, but they were not idle. Typically, when mom would say, just sit there and wait, that's exactly what she wanted me to do, but I would keep myself busy, and it wasn't with what she wanted me to do. That's not the case here. The disciples and apostles were paying attention. They were patient, but they were not idle. They were reading God's word as it was revealed in Acts chapter 1, finding out what God wanted them to do today. You and I need to be in that position, obedient, so that when the Holy Spirit moves us, we're ready. Now, there was the word suddenly, and then there was the word, or there was a sound. Now, when I picture this happening, especially when I pictured it as a young child, I pictured the, you know, the curtains blowing and all this, you know, that, you know, there's stuff flying around the room, but that's not what it says. It says there was a sound. The only thing I can equate that to is when I was growing up, I got my first job working on a peach farm, and it was not easy work, but that's beside the point. During that job, I saved my money. The first thing I bought was a 15-speed bike because it was better than a 10-speed, and I could get back and forth to work easier. The second thing, or if I remember correctly, the second thing I bought was a stereo system, state-of-the-art, compact, all-in-one except it had the speakers that you could put on each side of the room. Yep, you know where this is going. When I put that thing together and turned it on, I said, man, I can't wait until mom and dad leave. (laughs) Mom and dad would leave to go to the store or something, and the stereo would get turned up. And if you have had that experience as a young person, you feel the music. You feel the sound. The disciples and apostles are sitting there and they feel something and hear something. It wasn't wind. It was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It was a sound. I cannot explain that correctly. But it got their attention. 
There are many times in our lives we hear a sound so that God knows we're listening. Sometimes that sound is a song on the radio. Sometimes the sound is a crying child. Sometimes that sound is a loved one in the next room. Sometimes it's a sound in the silence that comes from the Holy Spirit. Elijah, when he was on the mountain and the wind and the, everything was turbulent outside, he only could hear that still small voice. Sound is something that God has used throughout history to get our attention. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. I wonder how many of them stood up. <laughs> Acts chapter 2 and verse 3 continues the story. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Now, there was a sound, and then there was a sight. Acts chapter 2 and verse 3 describes for us what they saw, sort of. It's a little confusing when you read it in the Greek. It's, it's not as easily explained as what we read in English. It appeared as something that looked like flame. But it just didn't appear it was on each of them. So I could see what was on you and you could see what was on me, but we probably couldn't look up, if that makes sense. And it sounds strange, and it was strange. It was to represent that there was a sound and there was a sight because God was doing something. The same way that he had done throughout all of history, he gets their attention and then he shows them something. The cloud and the fire, the cloud by day and the fire by night over the temple, the tent of meeting in the wilderness. I like the fact that this passage says it came to rest on each of them. Typically when we read this, we don't necessarily look at every word, but each of them. You have the 12 apostles, Matthias being named an apostle. You have the 120, there's Mary, there's Jesus' brothers. And there are many other people who have followed Jesus either for the whole time or for part of the time. And they were witnesses to the resurrection, evidently, and they were there. Each of them. Now, the apostles were closest to Jesus and had the best relationship with him. And Mary was his mother. And his brothers had probably not come around until he tapped on their door and said, Hey guys, I'm back. Now, that sounds very simple, but it's true. These are all real people in real situations. And on this day, they haven't changed into something supernatural. It's the same. And someone in the back of the room, who hadn't been a follower for very long, had the same thing happen to them as happened to the 12 apostles. And it's even elaborated on in the next, excuse me, in the next verse. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. Let's read together. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. There is nowhere in the New Testament that you will find. There is nowhere in the New Testament that you will find that the Holy Spirit is not involved in everyday life in the life of a believer. A believer without the Holy Spirit is an oxymoron. It doesn't happen. All of them received the Holy Spirit on this day and every day since when someone gives their heart to Christ, when they surrender, the Holy Spirit is available. Period. It's scriptural. It's there. It's the same thing. It's the 12 apostles, Mary, the brothers, and some guy that's just over there. He's been with us for three weeks now because he saw Jesus after he raised from the dead and he began to believe. It's everyone 
no matter when they came to believe that Jesus was the Son of God, the Holy Spirit comes to all of them. They were all filled. And then there is this Spirit-enabled speaking. Please don't forget, but you will receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. There is no witness that is a silent witness. They begin to speak in other languages. How do I know there are other languages? Because of what happens next. You see, what we're going to find is... (laughs) What we're going to find is that this seemed like a miracle of speaking but it was a miracle of hearing because the disciples and apostles listened and put themselves in a position they were able to speak the witness so that the others that were listening could hear the glories of God. The miracle is in the hearing as we're going to see. Everyone received the Holy Spirit. You and I, when we gave our heart to Christ and we surrendered our life, the Holy Spirit became available. But for most of the church of Jesus Christ, that surrender only goes so far. And the reason we can't get through the things in our lives or get over the obstacles in our way or through depression or relational issues or all kinds of things that crowd in to our life is not just because We can't handle them. It's because we are not accessing the power of the Holy Spirit that is available to us. It isn't taken away. It's there. The Scripture bears this out. But our choosing to access that power is only through surrender. It's only through surrender. Day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, surrender to what God's purpose and plan and timing is for us. On that day, there was a sound and there was a sight. And then, because of the Holy Spirit, there was speaking. Because after that, the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses. Let's continue reading in verse 5. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, we'll come back to that in a minute. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. That's 5 and 6. Verses 5 and 6. Now, The word staying, that doesn't doesn't mean that they came for a little while and stayed. It means that they were living there. There were living in Jerusalem at this time men and women and children who had come back to Jerusalem to live from wherever they grew up. Not only that, the sound they heard was not the sound of a mighty rushing wind. That was in the house. Because what we have read is They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They heard the sound of people speaking. And why did this grab their attention? We learn that as we continue reading. Verse 6. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And verse 7. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans. You see, it's a miracle of hearing as much as it is a miracle of speaking because those who were speaking were speaking in their native language. They were Galileans. They probably had an accent. Sort of like when you and I hear someone from Boston or from New York. They knew they could recognize by the the way they dressed and the inflection with which they used, except... They heard it in their own native tongue, not just in Aramaic or Greek. They heard it in their original tongue, what they learned 
when they learn to speak. This just magnifies something for you and I. When we are listening and in a position for God to use us, when we have surrendered, there's going to be someone listening that needs to hear a testimony about what God is doing in us and through us and the greatness of our God. And the Holy Spirit can use whatever we speak so that the person hearing hears what they need to hear. I've heard missionaries say that they've gone somewhere and spoken in their own tongue and people were able to understand them even though they didn't know the language. God can do anything He wants to do. But on this day, He was making a point. You need to be right with me. I'll take care of the hearer. You take care of you. You listen. You follow. You surrender. And my Holy Spirit will bridge the gap from what you have to say about me to the hearer. And he's still doing the same thing. You may, be, you may be saying to yourself, I'm not an evangelist, I'm not a witnesser. Then you're not a Christian. You are not a follower of Jesus Christ. Because it doesn't matter what you have to share that God has done in you. He's going to take care of the hearer. The church for too long has said, we need to stand up for what's right. That may be true. But the problem is, we need to stand up and give testimony to what God has done in us before we have the opportunity to say, he's called me to live this way, and here's the benefits. The problem is, we're trying to get people who do not know who Jesus is and don't care to follow what God has asked us to do. And in many times, we're not even living that way. The church of Jesus Christ needs to wake up and ask the Holy Spirit to begin to work in us, to bring us to the place where we're really listening, listening to the heart of God through his word, listening to the Holy Spirit when we speak. I don't want someone to know what I'm against. I want them to know what I'm for. As a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm choosing to live within the boundaries that he has put in place for me. And the benefits to that are what? You know, the people that live all around us are constantly bombarded with what they need. You need this car. You'll look cool when you drive down the road. You need this truck. You can tow that trailer you're going to buy eventually. You can borrow that money. Just check your credit score. <laughs> Ask your doctor about this drug. It'll make you feel better and look better. Not only that, it might help you lose weight. They are constantly bombarded day by day by day. So that when we stand up and say, I think you need Jesus to stop doing whatever it is, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear what God has done in me. And they want to see, by the way I live, that I'm different. On that day, the day of Pentecost, the things that happened were not just that the Holy Spirit came and the disciples spoke in tongues that were not their own. It was that. Now there is power available to the church, to you and to I, as we follow Christ, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, as we read earlier in the service. The problem is, there are very few people in our churches that exert this power so that we can witness it. So we think it doesn't exist. Because we still believe Seeing is believing instead of believing is seeing. We still think that seeing is believing instead of believing is seeing. The disciples got up on that morning. They got together in the upper room and they heard a sound and they saw a sight. And they couldn't stop speaking about what God had done in them and for them in raising Jesus from the dead in the power of the cross and the resurrection. They didn't go out and say, I can't believe you're letting these Romans do whatever. And I can't believe whatever. They didn't do that. They just witnessed to what God had done in Christ, in their lives, and in their city. They're just like you and I. But they were completely surrendered. Our level of surrender 
dictates our ability to access the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's go down to verse 12 in Acts chapter 2. Verse 12. The intervening verses just tell us the names or the places where the people were from in this passage. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? They were listening. What time is it? What is truth? Who is listening? They're all questions that we can ask ourselves so that we can decide how aligned we are with God, with what God wants to do in our lives. The who's listening is not just me. It's the fact that until I am right with God and surrendered, those who are ready to listen may get mixed messages when I speak. I want to be surrendered so that not only my life, but my words are used by the power of the Holy Spirit because there are people that need miracles. Jesus came to set those who are bound free. And if I'm going to follow his example, it's only going to be because, it's only going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit living in me. Jesus is our example. He lived by what the Father's plan and purpose was for him. And he stayed in constant contact with him. And he said to the disciples, you guys need to follow my example. And if you obey my teaching, the Father will be in me and I will be in you. The power of the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus surrendered everything. And he's calling us to surrender. Because we never know who's going to be the one who's listening to us. Church of Jesus Christ, are you ready to answer the question, who is listening with I am? Let's pray. Father, in these few moments, will you guide our hearts as we sing together? Would you allow us to be challenged by your word? Would you allow us to be challenged by the songs that we're singing, the song that we're singing, and that we might recognize that truly you orchestrate who is listening when we're speaking. You set the appointment. You allow us to be right where we're supposed to be when we're aligned with your power, with your plan, with your purpose for us, that truly we might know who you are and your plan, that we might love you supremely and others unconditionally, and that we might serve you in our church, in our family, and in our community. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Rise up.
for joining us today, both you online and those of you who are here this morning. I just want to challenge us to consider who is listening. Based on everything we've looked at in the book of Acts, the fact is, surrender is the key. And as you have opportunities this week, share your faith, share the hope that you have and what God has done in your lives. May God bless you in the week ahead. And may you see him and his opportunities all around you. God bless you. Amen.